All right, good morning, fellow miners. Welcome to the program where we dig through the scriptures looking to better understand Christianity and also doctrines that are not Christianity, as may be the case in some of our points today. It, uh, it's been a couple months since I did uh, part one of the doctrine, doctrine or the historical review of the Word of Wisdom. I thought I would get through this a lot faster, but it's seriously taken me the last two months to really flesh out the ideas and find the corroborating scriptures needed to substantiate certain uh, interpretations of the word wisdom. Um, I thought I had a pretty good grasp and understanding of the doctrines and the interpretations and the various verses, um, but then I, I did a concerted study looking to the scriptures for other evidence of these interpretations, and I came to find out that I really was off base in a lot of my understanding. And as I go through um, some of the things that I found, maybe uh, you'll find the same conclusion. If, if that's the case, then that's, that's okay, because we're all here to learn and grow and try and understand what we need to do as followers of Jesus Christ better. Now, this is a sermon on doing better. Um, we have, as a people, have benefited from this strict observance of the word of wisdom without question. Um, the prohibition list has led to avoidance of countless um, experiences of suffering and misery. There's, there's no question to that, but there is room for improvement. And in some aspects, a lot of room for improvement. Um, there has been errors that have been perpetuated by the culture with this story. I'm just trying to be upfront with you about some of this stuff. Um, so you know, want to know if you want to turn the video off now or later. Um, there's been errors that have been perpetuated, false teachings by the culture that have been perpetuated over generations that if corrected, I believe will bring us more in line with God's will concerning these principles. Now, if you're somebody of the opinion that errors have not been perpetuated by the culture that our leaders cannot teach something incorrectly, then um, this discussion is not gonna be beneficial for you. This is, an, this is a, an exercise in identifying scriptures for interpreting doctrine from other scriptures rather than using teachings from um, leaders for interpreting doctrines and scriptures, if that makes sense. Um, so what I'm saying is that we as a people can do, do better. If you think that's apostate, then we have different opinions on what's apostate. If you think that saying that our leaders can do better at clarifying doctrines, at teaching doctrines of Jesus Christ more clearly, if that's apostate, then we have very different opinions on what's apostate. Um, if that bothers you, then just don't watch this video. Then um, I don't want to upset your status quo and... Uh, make anybody angry. But there's some things that I've found in scripture and history that bring some clarif clarification to DNC 89 that I think are gonna be productive for all of us. Um, so I'm just putting that disclaimer out front. If none of that scares you, then uh, let's move forward with a productive discussion and uh, I'm gonna present things to consider when you're formulating your belief system are surrounding uh, Doctrine and Covenants 89 and the Doctrine of the Word of Wisdom. So, this idea of apostate doctrines seeping into the church um, is not my idea. In fact, um, President Ezra Traff Benson said once in uh, 1969, not only are there apostates in our midst, but there are apostate doctrines which are sometimes taught in our classes and from our pulpits, and which appear in our publications. These apostate precepts of men cause our people to stumble. As the Book of Mormon speaking to our day states, they have all gone astray, save it be a few who are the humble followers of Christ. Nevertheless, they are led that in many instances they do error because they are taught by the precepts of men. President Benson is acknowledging that apostate doctrines have and do seep into the church from the overwhelming cultural religion that is on top of every doctrinal religion. 
including Mormonism. Um, so just to uh, bring us up to speed on where we're at, it's uh, January. It's been a couple months since I uh, po posted part one, the historical analysis. If you haven't watched that, please do, because that really sets the uh, foundation, the stage for the doctrinal analysis, looking at everything that's been taught over the course of the last 180 years regarding um, the word of wisdom revelation. Um, it's two and a half hours. I know that's a lot to get through. I'm actually really surprised that, that anybody sat through that. After I got et done editing this, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm just like pushing on them two and a half hours of, of drab history. Just, oh, I don't know how that came out. But uh, for those of you who sat through the two and a half hours of the historical um, account of that, uh, hats off to you. I can barely sit through it after, after editing it. Um, so where we're at now, Proposition 2 in Utah, the um, bill that um, was putting forth legalization of medical marijuana has, uh, was voted for in favor by the Utah um, voters. It wasn't binding, um, but it did give an indication of the sentiment of where the people's mind are. And the church has since come out in support of Proposition 2 with some compromises. So it is going to go into effect as law in some form or another in, in uh, 2019. Um, so that uh, is moving forward with, uh, with the church on board. Um, but I'm not going to get into the politics of that. Um, however, it is still important for us to understand the purpose and meaning of the word of wisdom because it goes far beyond the use of medical marijuana. It goes into every aspect of um, our diet um, as human beings on this earth. So with, uh, with uh, Proposition 2 um, still in the discussion, I'm gonna read to you um, Wikipedia's response to uh, modern can cannabis movement. Um, just to state where the church is currently in its position on um, medical marijuana uh, or marijuana in general, and uh, that will kind of frame this discussion. So, um, as medical and recreational cannabis decriminalization movements began in the late 20th and early 21st centuries in the United States, the LDS Church has been asked for its position on the issue. In 2010, in a 2010 conference for local church leaders of in Colorado, general authorities of the church, including new current church president, Russell M. Nelson, explained in an answer to a question that the church has no position on medical marijuana and that the issue was left, that's currently, that wasn't the case in the past, there's no position on medical marijuana and that the issue was left to individual consultation with scriptures and members bishop. That's what we're going to do. We're gonna, cons we're gonna consult the scriptures in our interpretation of this and hopefully uh, gain some insights into how to view the whole discussion. Uh, the same stance was later reiterated in a private discussion among the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles in a 2010 video that was made public in 2016. The discussion included consensus that the church opposed recreational marijuana use more broadly, but had no position on medical use specifically. So now it's the current as I understand the current position with marijuana is, it's not the substance, it's how you use it. Medicinally rec versus recreationally. Now, those who use it for recreation might take the position that, well, they're using it to combat depression or com combat the dullness of life or whatever, is that medicinal? The church has gotten into this, uh, this gray area where they've, um, they're advocating for medicinal use, not recreational use. And the lines of where medicinal and recreational um, cross are kind of blurred. Um, so that is a very precarious position to be in. Um, I don't know how you define it. It depends on what you mean by recreation and it depends by what you mean by medicinal. Um, obviously, recreational users are gaining some sort of physical benefit from it similar in a similar way to um, medicinal users. So I guess it now becomes the job of a doctor to determine what's recreational, what's medicinal, what's to battle depression or mood swings or anxiety or whatever. 
versus um, things that are considered purely for fun. Uh, that's a tough, that's a tough gray area to uh, sort out, but that's where we're at today. In uh, February 2016, the church released a statement supporting efforts to legalize CBD oil in Utah, but not whole plant cannabis remedies. While we are not in a position to eva evaluate specific medical claims, that's kind of actually what you're doing. The church understands that there are some individuals who may benefit from the medicinal use of compounds found in marijuana. For that reason, although the church opposes State Bill 73, a former bill that is dead, it has raised no objection to State Bill 89, another dead bill. These two competing pieces of legislation take very different approaches when it comes to issues like access, distribution, control, and the potential harm of the hallucinogenic compound THC. In October 2016, the First Presidency of the LDS Church sent a letter to congregations in California, Nevada, and Arizona, which are states which are states which were to vote on legalized recreational cannabis um, that year, urging members to oppose legalization. Drug abuse in the United States is at, this is their statement, I believe. Drug abuse in the United States is at, at epidemic proportions and the dangers of marijuana to public health and safety are well documented. Recent studies have shed light particularly on the risks marijuana use po poses to brain development in youth. The accessibility of recreational marijuana in the home is also a danger to children. We urge church members to let their voices be heard in opposition to the legalization of recreational marijuana. Okay, so they're citing as their, as their reasoning behind this scientific and sociological studies as reasons for opposing it, opposing uh, legalization of recreational use of marijuana. So currently the church is for and against marijuana, depending on how it's used, if it's recreational or medicinal. So we've gone far beyond dissect dissecting the various ingredients to determine the molecules that God forbids, like caffeine and things like that in, regarding the word of wisdom interpretation. And now we're dissecting the circumstances in which it's okay or not okay to use a certain substance. Who is to determine what is recreational? Who is determined to what is medical? Only those who can afford or have access to a doctor. Uh, the church is getting mired in a very murky territory. And this is all, as I see it, a result of shifting views on Doctrine and Covenants 89. So um, the shifting views that were influenced by the political movements, by the medical literature and the um, psychological literature of various days in the, in the 20th century and before, um, which shifted and moved around the different views and stance of the position of the church on various substances regarding the word of wisdom, what's prohibited and what's not, what's good, what's bad appears to be continuing today. Um, I don't think we're gaining any traction or moving closer to clarity in um, this health law, as it's called, unfortunately. So um, I wanna take a little bit of different approach to uh, viewing this and what I've seen out there. Um, the predominant view for interpreting the word of wisdom, quite honestly, is, is teachings from former leaders of the church, um, whether that's uh, first presidency, apostles, or 70s, or stake presidents, bishops, all those. That's, but they base their understanding based on their own experience, and it's heavily influenced by the scientific lit literature of the day. Um, a good example of this, and I hate to uh, throw President Hinckley under the bus because he's one of my favorite. He was a uh, president of the church when I uh, went on my mission. And I owe him a great debt of gratitude for the inspiration that he had in my life in um, choosing to serve a mission and uh, following some of the other standards of the church. However, he gives a good example of um, the basis for interpreting the word of wisdom on a leadership level. Uh, this was actually while I was on my mission, he gave an interview in 1998, that's pretty famous. It's when a president of the church came out and started speaking publicly on national TV for really the first time ever um, without a script, 
we're so used to hearing the leaders of the church read off of teleprompter that it's kind of shocking and jarring when they uh, speak, um, uh, when they just speak like normal people talk. Um, and this was one of the first times that, that happened. Uh, in 1998, uh, he had this conversation with Larry, Larry King that identifies this basis for interpreting the word of wisdom. Uh, I'm gonna to read to you this transcript. Uh, Larry King asked, what is your role? Uh, President Hinckley, my role is to just declare doctrine. My role is to stand as an example before the people. My role is to be a voice in defense of the truth. My role is to stand as a conservator of those values which are important in our civilization and society. My role is to lead people. So he says, my role is to declare doctrine. All right, well, Larry King presses his presses him on a few pieces of doctrine here. Okay, President. Um, a caller asked, called in and asked, I was wondering about some of the guidelines and the dietary restrictions Mormons live by and how strictly members follow it because I was reading once the word of wisdom. My impression was that its major point was that one should respect all life, including animals, and as such only consume them when absolutely necessary to sustain life. This is a very astute caller. I don't, she, she's not a member of the church, um, but uh, she, she's dissected some very important key aspects to the, to the revelation and others. Only consume them when absolutely necessary to save life and to eat them sparingly. But I've noticed that this is rarely followed by Mormons. Okay, President. President Hinckley's response was, oh, I don't know. Well, you're supposed to know, first of all. You've read part of the Word of Wisdom. The Word of Wisdom covers many things. It covers the excess use of meat, as I see it. It covers in a very particular way the use of tobacco and alcohol. Larry King by saying no. President Hinckley by saying, by prescribing those things. No to caffeine, no to caffeine, coffee and tea. Do you know why dietary in the Old Testament were based on the health of animals and stuff? President Hinckley, well, the wonderful thing is that the Book of Mormon, I mean, the Word of Wisdom has shown to be fruitful in what it accomplishes. Larry King, you are ahead of yourself in the health grace. Gordon B. Hinckley, yes. This man I met here not too long ago at UCLA, Inkstrom, I think his name is, who had conducted a study for some 14 years taking a peer group of Latter-day Saints, a peer group of the other population and reach a conclusion that because of the degree to which we observe the word of wisdom, Mormons have a life expectancy from eight to 11 years longer. Now, who in the world wouldn't give almost anything for eight to 10 years of life? I have with me right now a statement from the Los Angeles Times on this very fact. So what we see here is President Hinckley's response in, uh, to that caller's question regarding meat um, consumption as identified in the word of wisdom. And uh, he brushed that aside as inconsequential and not very important and immediately went to the coffee, tea, tobacco, and alcohol segments of the word wisdom. Um, that is basically everybody's response to the word of wisdom. Um, the only things that are focused on are those four substances, even though coffee and tea aren't actually mentioned in it. Um, alcohol or strong drink um, and tobacco use are talked about. But there's a myriad of other things in Doctrine and Covenants 89 that are very beneficial, that are important. And, uh, but President Hinckley's response is absolutely typical of how we viewed the Word of Wisdom for a long time, how we interpret it and how we teach it. And then as support for his views, he goes to scientific literature of the day, um, citing two different, uh, one article and another study from UCLA to uh, support their his position. Um, that's problematic because relying on the universities, the learning of the world is discussed in scriptures as a very dangerous thing. Um, but yet that's where we're going. And some might say, well, he's just speaking to the audience that don't believe the scriptures. I would say, well, the audience needs to be introduced to the scriptures. What better place than on national TV? But that's for him to decide. It's just typical of what our response to the word of wisdom is. Um, in 1989, President Hinckley talked 
about the scourge of illegal drugs on society in a conference talk, um, mentioning cocaine babies, and then offers as a persuasive argument that we should avoid these things because of what the Lord said in the word of wisdom. Here's what he said. Although I recognize that drugs are not mentioned specifically in the word of wisdom, I'm confident that the promise attached to that revelation will apply also to those who refrain from these evil and vicious destroyers. I repeat, therefore, these marvelous words of the Lord and all saints who remember to keep and do these sayings, walking in obedience to the commandments shall receive health in their navel and marrow to their bones and shall find wisdom and great treasures of knowledge, even hidden treasures and shall run and not be weary and shall walk and not faint. And I, the Lord, give unto them a promise that the destroying angel shall pass them by as the children of Israel and not slay them. Okay, so take a look at what he's advocating here. He admits that things that aren't specifically mentioned in the word of wisdom, he believes are attached to the promises in the word of wisdom. He says specifically, let's read through this again. Although I recognize that drugs are not mentioned specifically in the word of wisdom, I am confident that the promise attached to that revelation will apply also to those who refrain from these evil and vicious destroyers. I repeat these words of the Lord. Okay, so this is the other major cultural problem that's surrounding DNC 89. If we attach things to the word of wisdom that aren't in the word of wisdom, then the word of wisdom becomes infinitely malleable into whatever ideas, whether it's scientific, cultural, personal, whatever ideas we have, the Word of Wisdom covers in some way or another. Even things that aren't in the Word of Wisdom all of a sudden become part of the Word of Wisdom. This has been going on for our, over a hundred years. And the problem with that is whenever you make anything infinitely malleable, where anything can be the Word of Wisdom, then nothing is the Word of Wisdom. Then the things that are actually in the Word of Wisdom are, what's the word? They're meaningless. The actual words of the Lord are meaningless. If it can mean anything, then it means nothing. Then why do we even have the word? Why wouldn't the Lord just say, don't use anything, I don't know, that's harmful in some way or another? That would cover everything. But somehow we have taken the word of wisdom and used it in a way to where it's malleable into whatever ideas we have that about something that's bad. Illicit drugs they're bad. They're scorched to society. But so is anger. So are uh, guns by some standards um, or gangs or anything else. Is the word wisdom talking about gangs? Is it talking about anything else? If we take whatever we want to advocate that's loosely based to the health or well-being psychologically or physically of some person's being, of their body, of their temporal salvation, and we attach that or work in the word of wisdom by the side, well, this is what God was talking about, then it can mean anything. And when we say it can mean anything, then it has no meaning. The actual words in there have no meaning. That's, uh, that's very problematic. So we just can't throw around the word wisdom revelation as if, as if it was infinitely malleable into whatever problem we're facing as a society. I mean, if you do that, then you could say, all right, well, there's an obesity epidemic. Well, the word of wisdom told us not to eat whatever's causing that obesity epidemic based on scientific liter literature. That's the other problem with, um, with uh, President Hinckley's statements and everybody's in general is that we rely on scientific literature to back up our claims. And scientific literature, medical literature, the studies are all over the place. Um, the profession, the medical profession, for example, um, well, let me just, let me just share with you this article, um, that, uh, comes from scientificamerican.com. It's titled, how many die from medical mistakes in the U S hospitals? It seems that every time researchers estimate how often a medical mistake contributes to a hospital patient's death, the numbers come out worse. In 1999, the Institute of Medicine published the famous To Air is Human report, which dropped a bombshell on the medical community by reporting that up to 98,000 people a year die because of mistakes in hospitals. The number was initially dis disputed, but is now widely accepted by doctors and hospital officials. 2014, and quoted ambiguously in the media. 
In 2010, the Officer of Inspector General for Health and Human Services said that bad hospital care contributed to the death of 180,000 patients in Medicare alone in a given year. Now comes a study in the current issue of the Journal of Patient Safety that says the number may be much higher in 2014, between 210,000 and 440,000 patients each year who got to the hospital for care suffer some type of preventable harm that contributes to their death, the study says. That would make medical errors the third leading cause of death in America behind heart disease, which is the first, and cancer, which is the second. Boy, that, we're talking in the U.S., half a million people a year potentially die from medical errors. I mean, the medical in- the medical profession, the medical industry is is a great blessing to humanity. Don't get me wrong. But we're talking about an industry that kills, some would argue, kills more people than they actually save. Why would we base our understanding of God's will on the latest medical literature? And this article kind of destroys the credibility of the medical industry. Um, in the same way that we can look at 100 years ago that the practice of bloodletting or of using leeches to try and suck diseases out of people was foolish. They were doing that based on the medical literature of the day. Now, we've come a long way since then, but with half a million deaths in the U.S. um, ascribed to medical mishaps or errors that were preventable, according to these studies, the medical profession has a long way to go before they get a clean track record and become, in my estimation, credible. Um, yeah, basing, basing uh, our understanding of God's will based on the wisdom of men is, is foolish. It's, and we're going to look 200 years from now, we're going to look back at, at, the, at this time and they'll be like, what were you doing? Just like we were looking back at 100 years, what were you thinking? Putting leeches on people and causing them to bleed and trying to uh, cure diseases? That's going to seem so foolish to us right now, just like 100 years from now, they're going to look back and be like, you guys were causing half a million deaths a year because you didn't know this or that about how the human body works. That's going to happen. It's inevitable. Um... The other aspect of, um, of uh, medical literature that's problematic is that there's contradicting studies. Some would say this substance is bad. You know, it's like uh, sugar is bad. So we switch to high fructose corn syrup, you know, just as bad. Or um, some advocate for uh, no, eating no meat. Others, the Atkins diet's for me. I mean, there's opinions in the medical industry there's studies that can prove any position you want you could take you could, there's probably studies out there that show um the medical benefits of doing crack cocaine or something along those lines i'm sure there's something out there it's like saying there's a substance that is taken too much of will kill you but if taken too little will kill you if exposed to in certain situations it will kill you in minutes and it's also the leading, a leading cause of fatalities among small children and also the leading cause of driver-impaired motor vehicle fatalities much greater than alcohol. It's also one of the most widely available, cheapest compounds on the planet. What is this substance? And you might be thinking, and how do we ban it? Well, the substance I'm talking about is water. Water, if taken too much of, can kill you, can have bad health effects. And if taken too little, you die of dehydration. If exposed to in certain situations, it'll kill you like you don't have any air. Um, It's also a leading cause of fatalities among small children that drown. It's also a leading cause of driver-impaired motor vehicle fatalities with slick roads, icy roads, and snowy roads greater than alcohol. And it's one of the most widely available, cheapest compounds on the planet. So you can frame, my point is you can frame anything to make it look bad and make it look like... um, like we need to get rid of it. You can just frame any argument based on whatever facts you, you choose to put forth or ignore. So studies, while they're interesting, uh, there's very few studies that are unbiased. So how do we terp- interpret the word of wisdom? 
if we can't trust the scientific and medical literature of the day, <clears throat> then what do we have to go off of? Well, I believe that the very best way to interpret the scriptures is to use the scriptures. That's why we have four standard works and a whole plethora of other scriptures that aren't even part of the canon of, of standard works that are still very useful. Tens of thousands of pages of God speaking to man, giving instructions and insights. The scriptures are the best, in, the best tool for interpreting the scriptures. The scriptures give the best commentary on the scriptures, of course, as long as they're translated correctly, as Joseph Smith taught. Um, and regarding the Word of Wisdom and Doctrine and Covenants DNC 89, um, I believe it's no different that we should use the scriptures primarily as our view for interpreting the scriptures. So that's what I'm going to do. And I was actually shocked to find out that there is a lot in the scriptures that give us clarity and information on the 21 verses in DNC 89. I was shocked at how much there is. So we're going to look at um, Doctrine and Covenants 49, 59, section 63, 133, um, as well as the New Testament, some things from the Book of Mormon. Um, all of these things inform us about how to view Section 89. In fact, Section 89, the health code in there, is really the third installment of a health code that was given by the Lord to Joseph Smith in Sections 49 and 59. And 89 is clarification of those two earlier um, sections as well as 63 and sections 76 and 133. I mean, there's just so much that give us insights into 89 that taking 89 by itself and not looking at these other scriptures is just ridiculous. There's, <laughs> we have so much more to draw from than that. The other, uh, the other aspect, um, the other way to interpret it or the other tool I'm gonna use in this doctrinal analysis is the earliest manuscripts um, that we have. There's, there's basically two of them that are the best ones. Um, one is the uh, um, pre-manuscript for um, Revelation uh, Book 2, which was a handwritten um, document that was, to, that was sent to the, um, the printer for the first Book of Commandments, and Doctrine and Covenants are all based upon that. That manuscript, and then one that was probably even earlier, that was uh, written by um, uh, Sidney Gilbert, uh, Revelation Book 2 was by Frederick G. Williams. Sidney Gilbert made a copy, which is probably the earliest copy of um, DNC 89 um, that we have. Um, scholars have kind of settled that those two documents are the best, and fortunately, both of those are available on the Joseph Smith Papers Archive, which we're gonna reference. And it's important to get back to the original documents because Christ warned um, the New Testament church about scribes and Pharisees, specific, specifically scribe changing doctrines. Scribes were those who would, who would take a document because they didn't have a printing press and then write it out and then write it out, make copies and so forth. The Dead Sea Scrolls were all made by various scribes, not from the Jewish church, they were the Seans, but that's what they were doing is they're writing them out. And what the temptation for scribes and why they're so dangerous is everybody walks through this life with their own views and opinions and convictions and belief system based on those convictions. And it's incredibly hard, almost impossible, I would say, for mankind to not interject their own convictions, their own opinions into doctrine or scripture. And as you have these documents passing from scribe to scribe over thousands of years, the chance of one scribe copying it correctly, first of all, is very, very small. And then second of all, not to interject their own opinions when they read something, be like, hmm, I don't know what this says. It's a little bit confusing. Let me put some more clarity to it. And then, then you have errors come up. That has actually happened in the short time that we've had Doctrine and Covenants 89 since 1833. Scribes have played a major role in shaping the cultural interpretation of Doctrine and Covenants 80, 
89, um, section 89, and have in fact, unfortunately, to my dismay, have changed some of the doctrines. Significant changes. I'm not talking about just uh, trying to clarify something that's basically the same gist. I'm talking about a 180 flip from what it means, and we're going to get to that. I'll show you what that is um, as we go further into this discussion. So um, now let's get into uh, the doctrine of the Word of Wisdom specifically. And DNC 89 is an expansion of Doctrine and Covenants 49 and 59 and 63 also informs us about this. So let's uh, review what it says in Doctrine and Covenants 59 because this really sets the stage for um, DNC 89 the previous revelations, the stuff that came before. Um, Doctrine and Covenants 59 is a revelation given to Joseph Smith in, Zach, in, in uh, Jackson County, Missouri on August 7th, 1831, two years approximately before um, DNC 89. And it advocates this, but remember that on this, the Lord's day, thou shalt offer thine oblations and thy sacraments unto the Most High, confessing thy sins unto thy brethren and before the Lord. And on this day thou shalt do nothing, no, none other thing, only let thy food be prepared with singleness of heart, that thy fasting may be perfect, or in other words, that thy joy may be full. Verily, this is fasting and prayer, or in other words, rejoicing in prayer. And inasmuch as ye do these things with thanksgiving and cheerful hearts and countenances, not with much laughter, for this is sin, but with glad heart and a cheerful countenance. Verily I say that inasmuch as ye do this, the fullness of the earth is yours, the beasts of the field, the fowls of the air, and that which climbeth upon the trees and walketh upon the earth. The Lord is identifying not necessarily what you use or consume, but how you do it. And he does it in a way that he counsels us that inasmuch as ye do these things with thanksgiving, with cheerful hearts and countenances, but with glad heart and cheerful countenance. That's the proper way for consuming the things of the earth, all right? Verily I say that inasmuch as ye do this, the fullness of the earth is yours, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air, and that which climbeth upon the trees and walketh upon the earth. Yea, and the herb and the good things which come of the earth whether for food or for raiment, for clothes, or for houses or for barns or for orchards or for gardens or for vineyards. Yea, all things which come of the earth in the season thereof are made for the benefit and use of man, both to please the eye and to gladden the heart. Yea, for food and for raiment, for taste and for smell, to strengthen the body and to enliven the soul. And it pleaseth God that he hath given all these things unto man, for unto this end were they made to be used, with judgment, not to excess, neither by extortion. And in nothing doth man offend God, or against none is his wrath kindled, save those who confess not his hand in all things and obey not his commandments. Behold, this is according to the law and the prophets. Okay, so we're gonna go re reference back to um, DNC 59, because this in a lot of ways parallels exactly what's in Doctrine and Covenants 89, but it's just from a different perspective under a different conversation, and DNC 89 builds upon DNC 59, so we're going to come back to that. So let's jump into DNC 89. Verse 1, a word of wisdom for the benefit of a council of high priests assembled in Kirtland and the church and also the saints of Zion. First question is, what is a word of wisdom? Okay, right out of the gates, we have false concepts in our cultural view of the word of wisdom because we call it the word of wisdom. But that is a cultural misunderstanding. Um, the scriptures comment on words of wisdom and uh, here's some things to consider. Um, before its association with this revelation, the phrase words of wisdom was understood as one of the spiritual gifts. Um, refer to 1 Corinthians 12.8 um, and the Book of Mormon, 1830 edition, page 586 or Moroni 10.9. 1 
For behold, to one is given by the Spirit of God that he may teach the word of wisdom, and to another that he may teach the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, and to another exceeding great faith, and to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, and again to another that he may work mighty miracles, and again to another that he may prophesy concerning all things, and again to another the beholding of angels and ministering spirits, and again to another all kinds of tongues, and again to another the interpretation of languages of diverse kinds of tongues. And all these gifts come by the Spirit of Christ, and they come unto every man severally according to his will. The first spiritual gift spoken of is, For behold, to one is given by the Spirit of God that he may teach the word of wisdom. What it's referencing is a method for receiving and teaching revelation from God. A word of wisdom is a spiritual gift. Joseph Smith obviously had this spiritual gift because we have the word of wisdom. As we're, but, but, but calling it the word of wisdom is, is an error because that's like saying, well, there's only one. It's the word of wisdom. It's, it's not a word of wisdom. It's not that thing. It's a process. So we have a word of wisdom. We have a revelation by the means, given by the means of a word of wisdom through the gift of of somebody who has the gift of a of teaching by the word of wisdom, it's not it's not just one thing. First uh, Corinthians Corinthians two eight says, for one it is given by the Spirit, the word of wisdom; to another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. I don't know of any other revelation um, that we've nicknamed. Oh, that's the word of knowledge, or that's the word of prophecy, or that section is. Um, the word of revelation. You know, I, I, this idea that this is the word of wisdom has to be like, we've got to get that out of our heads because it's looking at it the wrong way. Doctrine and Covenants 4617, just to prove this point. And again, verily I say to you, to some it is given by the Spirit of God, the word of wisdom. It's a process. It's a, it's a spiritual gift. It's a means for receiving revelation. Dog and Covenants 51, O hearken ye elders of my church, and give ear to the voice of the living God, and attend to the words of wisdom which shall be given unto you. So, um, guess what else came forth by this type of revelation? The Book of Mormon itself. And the words which he shall write shall be the words which are expedient in my wisdom should go forth unto the fruit of thy loins, and it shall be as if the fruit of thy loins had cried unto them, from the dust, for I know their faith. So if we're going to call something the Word of Wisdom, call the Book of Mormon the Word of Wisdom because it came forth through this revelatory process where, as I see it, and I might be wrong in this, um, the Word of Wisdom, the gift of the Word of Wisdom allows an individual to receive revelation literally what the Lord says, meaning the very words that the Lord uses. This is very different from impressions or inspiration, which kind of gave you a general idea of what to do or where to go. You know, the Lord impressed upon me or the Spirit constraineth me that I should do this thing. The word, the revelation by the means of word of wisdom, the gift of word of, of the word of wisdom is one that um, I believe creates scripture because the literal words, word by word, literally can be transcribed onto a piece of paper. The Lord gives actual words to the beneficiary of that spiritual gift. Um, that's what I'm. I might be wrong about this, but that's how that's how I see it. Um, so uh, some don't like the fact that Joseph Smith put it, his um, hat in his head and looked at a seer stone when he dictated the Book of Mormon, but that way, you know, that was part of the process of using the gift of a word of wisdom in the earthly translation process because with the Book of Mormon, it's very important to um, specify specific words, especially when clarifying doctrine that was lost from the Bible. You need very specific words, not just impressions or teachings um, or visions. You got to get the t text actually right. And what's, what's, what's so cool about this spiritual gift is that 
the person receiving it and transcribing it or getting the actual words of the Lord doesn't even need to understand it for it to be beneficial for that to future generations. As long as you get the text right, as long as the text is correct, then it's um, a revelation to anybody that reads it afterwards. The individual doesn't actually need to understand it in that thing. Whereas if it's an inspired, inspired teaching, the individual needs to understand it. So there's very, these different methods serve different purposes in God bestowing knowledge upon humankind. And the word of wisdom method is uh, unique and special and, and it's, pretty, it's a pretty cool thing. Um, Doctrine and Covenants 78, 2, and listen to the counsel of him who has ordained you from on high who shall speak in your ears the words of wisdom that salvation might, may be unto you in that thing which you have presented before me, saith the Lord God. So pretty much the entire book of commandments, Doctrine and Covenants, are revelations classified as brought forth through the gift of words of wisdom because they are uh, revelatory from God with specific literal meanings. And identifying the method for the revelation coming forth is important because if it's a literal sentence that is constructed, that's created, that God creates scripture by revealing this through somebody who has this gift, then the exact phrases, the punctuation, the um, words in there matter. They're very specific and they matter. It's not just an inspired discourse that you can kind of apply to all these different things, which is kind of what we've done. That's what we, that's why I identified President Hinckley's comments on it. Um, looking at the Word of Wisdom, Doctrine and Covenants 89, I should say, um, as an inspired teaching allows you to take inspiration from that and apply it in an, ins an inspiring way to narcotics or to carbs or to uh, you know, certain to the Atkins diet or whatever you want to do. You can take inspired texts and kind of run with those, um, taking inspiration from those. But if it's brought forth by a word of wisdom, the words matter. And the very literal words and sentence structure and punctuation matter. They're important. And we can't discount that. We can't make it infinitely malleable. They matter. And we have to pay attention to those. And we can't change it. Um, if we do so, it's to our own condemnation. Um, we we run, run the risk of losing all meaning in that, that um, revelation. So, um, with verse 1, very specifically, the Lord states, this is coming forth by the gift of a word of wisdom. He's saying the words matter, the actual words matter, pay attention. This was also... Uh, Reiterated by Alma in the Book of Mormon, For behold, the Lord doth grant unto all nations of their own nation and tongue to teach his word, yea, in wisdom, all that he seeth fit they should have. Therefore we see that the Lord doth counsel in wisdom according to that which is just and true. And Psalm 3730, The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom, and his tongue talketh of judgment. Doctrine and Covenants 9820 um, talks about this. I don't know. I could I could go through scriptures all day. We're gonna we're gonna um, let's move on. Okay, I think we have hammered that point home. So, um, word of wisdom. What is wisdom? That's the next question that came. Uh, Noah Webster's eighteen twenty Nick Dick twenty eight dictionary defines it as such: the right use or exercise of knowledge, the choice of laudable ends, and of the best means to accomplish them. This is wisdom in act, effect, or practice. If wisdom is to be considered as a faculty of the mind, it is the faculty of dis discerning or judging what is most just, proper, and useful. And if it is to be considered as an acquirement, it is the knowledge and use of what is best, most just, most proper, most conductive to prosperity or happiness. Wisdom in the first sense or practical wisdom nearly synonymous with discretion. <clears throat> it differs somewhat from prudence. In this respect, prudence is the exercise of sound judgment in avoiding evils. Wisdom is the exercise of sound judgment either in avoiding evils or attempting good. Prudence then is a species of wis which wisdom is the genius. So how I understand it is wisdom is necessarily 
necessary if you're going to choose between two good things or two bad things. You need to exercise wisdom. Um, exercising prudence is something where if you have a law, you can, it's prudent, you might find it prudent to um, obey that law, whether it's the law of God or, or anything else, speaking law, any kind of law, whether it's prudent to obey that law or not, it's prudent. But to be wise, to exercise wisdom, you need to be able to have the capacity to choose between two competing ideas, two things that both have good outcomes or both have bad outcomes, and be able to discern which is the better course. So this directly flies in the face of, um, of the interpretation that the word of wisdom is a health law. Laws don't require wisdom to implement. I mean, some might say, well, you're wise by following the law. No, you're, you're just being smart. You can be prudent. You can be conscientious. But to be wise in wisdom, it's be, to be, you have the ability to discern between two good things. And be able to choose the higher principle. That's why principles require wisdom. Laws require obedience. Does that make sense? Uh, Jordan Peterson, a well-known um, psychologist, Canadian clinician, was asked in a forum, is there a way to quantify wisdom and see its relationship to IQ? His response is, we can't measure wisdom. Psychologists have not been able to measure wisdom. wisdom. We're not that wise enough to quantify wisdom. If there is a relationship between intelligence and wisdom, there isn't much of one. The other thing I've noticed among my clients is that intelligence allows yourself to drive yourself crazy in unbelievably creative and manipulative ways. It's quite common for psychologists to experience phenomena where the intelligent client who is having mental trouble is in much more trouble than, he, than the less intelligent client because first, they're arrogant, second, they can argue like mad for the validity of their pathology even though they know perfectly well that it's destroying their life. So I really do think that they, that they, intelligence and wisdom, are not self-evidently related. Um, that's incredibly insightful. Uh, that was from a panel discussion for the SFL Regional Conference in Vancouver, Canada. DNC 67.6, now seek ye out of the Book of Commandments, even the least that is among them, and appoint him that is the most wise among you. Lord counsels us to have leaders that exercise wisdom. So this puts us into this uh, debate, wisdom versus laws. <sighs> Is there any wisdom in a law or in obeying a law for that matter? Laws are in place, they have their purpose, they're very utilitarian in bringing people closer to God, but they're primarily used as a safety net to keep people from slipping into the grasp and control of the adversary. Um, laws are in place because we are not wise in some area. A good example of that is the children of Israel. Um, God wanted to impose, un, he wanted to uh, dispose unto them his wisdom and have a personal relationship with them, but they wouldn't come up into the mount, and so he needed to impose on them laws. Um, wisdom and laws are fundamentally opposed in their origin and their outcome, how we act. If we act in wisdom or if we need to be subjected to laws. Laws are a lesser, lesser gospel that are not principle-based. Um, they're put in place to govern a people who do not act in wisdom based upon experience with the ability to choose between two good choices or make the best of two bad choices. They are not able to produce the best possible outcome. They are not wise. The scriptures counsel us over and over to be wise, but if we can't act in wisdom like the children of Israel, then the Lord gives us laws. Um, that's... That's how we, I think we need to view laws um, versus wisdom, which are principle-based. Laws are fine as long as they come from God, but the problem occurs when we claim that the laws of God um, that come from men are, in fact, laws of God. Um, when we claim that fabricated laws or fabricated commandments of men are actual law, laws of God. The scriptures call this teaching for doctrines and commandments of men, and that is a very bad thing very bad thing. 
that we need to be very careful of. Mark uh, chapter 7 identifies this one evil endeavor can undermine an entire religion. When he said, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. <sighs> He's recording the words of Christ. Of course, um, those are pretty searing. If you think about it, in vain do they worship me. The worship that you put forth is all for naught. It's in vain. It profit, profiteth us nothing if our heart is far from them. And we teach for doctrines the commandments of men. Christ warns us that if we teach these doctrines as commandments of men, our religious efforts are in vain. They account for nothing. They're a waste of time and energy and won't produce the blessings that are associated with obedience to the principles or commandments that um, our religion advocates or that God advocates. Um, so it can negate the principles or the promises that are ascribed to those, the blessings that are ascribed to those um, principles if we live them. And this is important for DNC 89 because the end of it promises specific things. And if we don't, if we teach or live out doctrines that are really the commandments of men, then we invalidate our access to those promised blessings. And they're really great blessings that I don't think we want to miss out on because of ignorance in these things. So we have to be aware of this. Um, wisdom of men versus wisdom of God. Um, some more scriptures that frame this, this concept are uh, 2 Nephi 28:26. Yea, woe be unto him that hearkeneth unto the precepts of men and denieth the power of God and the gift of the Holy Ghost. Um, 2 Nephi 26, 20, And the Gentiles are lifted up in the pride of their eyes and have stumbled because of the greatness of their stumbling block that they have built up many churches. Nevertheless, they put down the power and miracles of God and preach up unto themselves their own wisdom and their own learning that they might get gain and grind upon the face of the poor. <sighs> our own wisdom and our own learning. If we step out with interpretations outside of what's actually in the text of the DNC 89, is that not our own wisdom? If we reference scientific and medical literature of the day for um, how we should view and interpret DNC 89, is that not our own learning? It's not even our own learning, it's, it's others learning. Um, and then using our own experience, as I've came across many examples of in the online discussions regarding DNC 89, many people say, well, I have a testimony that DNC 89 is true principle because I chose not to eat meat for a whole year and I lost 70 pounds and I feel great and, and I started sleeping and my snoring went away, something like that, you know? That's our own learning and our own understanding of something that we have to be very careful of um, as, as uh, Nephi warned here. Romans 1.22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. DNC 76, 9, and their wisdom shall be great and their understanding reach to the heaven and before them the wisdom of the wise shall, shall perish and the understanding of the prudent shall come to naught. 2 Nephi 9, and whoso knocketh to him will will he open and the wise and the learned, they that are rich who are puffed up because of their learning and their wisdom and their riches, yea, they are they whom he despiseth. And save they shall cast these things away and consider themselves fools before God and come down in the depths of humility, he will not open unto them. Wow, so in regards to the promises that are promised at the end of DNC 89, the treasures of knowledge and stuff that we want God to open up to us, I think a prerequisite for that is that we consider ourselves fools before God and come down in the depths of humility. Otherwise, he will not open those things unto us. So, um, teaching for commandments, doctrines of men, or teaching for doctrines, commandments of men, 
we've warned about this. And uh, I, I uh, had a great experience um, learning what this looks like if you give it enough time to percolate in, in a culture or society um, in Jerusalem, which I shared in the first video, where um, we took um, a lunch break in a town square in Jerusalem and we were eating our sandwiches and a guy comes up screaming and yelling and, and throwing us out, telling us to leave. And our guide later explained that what we had done is we had uh, broken the orthodox view of the law of Moses, one of the laws, in bringing a meat sandwich into a milk section of the outdoor pavilion. And this was based upon the law that st states that a baby calf should not be boiled in its mother's milk. And the fence that the rabbis put around that was, well, to make sure we don't do that, then let's make it a law that um, um, no meat get boiled in any milk. And then somebody else came along, well, let's make that a law, let's dissect that law and make sure if no meat should be boiled in any milk, it must be because God's real intention was meat should not touch milk, so let's never touch milk and meat, dairy products and, and meat together, which is why you'll never find a cheeseburger um, in the orthodox, na orthodox neighborhoods in Israel. Um, dairy products and meat shouldn't milk shouldn't touch. And so then the fence that they put around that, the law, if that's the law, well, then it must be because touching milk and meat is bad. So to make sure we don't break the law of Moses, we need to have separate refrigerators for milk and for meat and separate dishwashers for milk and meat. And we're going to, just to make sure that we don't accidentally touch milk and meat anywhere, um, let's have people that are eating meat sandwiches sit over there and people that are drinking milk sit over there. Just, you know, this is the mentality of a pharisaical society um, that Jesus denounced when he came. And unfortunately, you know, they, they dissect the laws and they, they put onto it their own wisdom, their own learning. And then they start devolving into teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. And this guy in Jerusalem was so agitated because he, what, what he supposed was somebody was about, was potentially... Well, what's breaking the law of Moses, which milk and meat need, can't be near each other? And he got so angry and agitated based on that understanding of the doctrine that he ran up and yelled at us and th kicked us out of this outdoor pavilion. This dissecting of God's will based on our own understanding, you know, that seems ridiculous, but that's exactly what we've done as a culture, as a Mormon culture with the word of wisdom. Um, so we have to, uh, differentiate between what's the laws of God. Um, a good example of that is probably caffeine where, um, the word of wisdom, DC 89 says no hot drinks, hot drinks are not for good for the belly or body. And then it's interpreted, okay, well that must be, uh, coffee and tea. That's cause that's what we drink hot. So coffee and tea. And then later people come along, well, coffee and tea must be bad because of caffeine. Oh, we know caffeine has some negative side effects. So if caffeine's bad, then uh, we shouldn't drink caffeine, whether it's in chocolate or, um, caffeinated drinks. And next thing you know, BYU bans caffeinated drinks from its cafeteria. And we're like, we're being more righteous. We're living the law of DNC 89, rah, rah, rah. Um, this mentality of, of dissecting ingredients of the word of wisdom is so per pervasive and typical of um, people in scriptures that, that that's why every, that's why the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants and uh, Old and New Testaments are all warning of doing this, a warning of the wisdom of men. And unfortunately, with Proposition 2 and medical marijuana, we're doing that even more so by saying, okay, it's the THC component of cannabis that is more bad. So let's make sure that that doesn't get into the hands of the people. But the oil, which doesn't contain as much of that, is okay. The church is like dissecting and dissecting and then they're even going into the aspect of and how you actually use it, recreational versus medical, is, you know, it's just like dissecting and dissecting and, and all of that. If we didn't have DNC 89, I, I bet you anything, there would be no discussion. The church would not be involved in, in the medical marijuana debate or the legalization of marijuana debate. It's, it's, 
because just because they don't reference DNC 89 in their public statements doesn't mean that that's the basis for all of it. Um, because all of these other political movements um, the church doesn't get involved in has not been so vocal about even stuff regarding um, uh, health codes and things like that. Like, I mean, what about when uh, New York made it illegal to have, I think it was, what, 44 ounce drinks at one time? You know, the church didn't get involved in, in those kind of things. But as soon as California starts going down the path of legalizing marijuana, like, ha, we know something about that. We know God's will. We need to protect our members from themselves and take away that blight from humanity. And then when you start getting into that, then they have to explain why. And you start getting into, well, it's because of this compound and it's this use and this manner and what's recreation. I mean, it's just a mess. In the same way that the law of Moses regarding milk and meat is a mess. And what I believe is in error because by straining at the gnat in this thing, we completely miss the gospel of Jesus Christ and for what purpose the laws are given or for what purpose the principles are given. So we need to differentiate between the laws of God and the policies of the church and wise counsel of leaders. Um, we have a tendency in, as a culture and a people to just group everything in the same category as the mind and will of God. If it comes from Salt Lake over the pulpit, then it must be the mind of will of God. However, policies of the church, how even if they're inspired, need to be viewed as policies and not necessarily the mind and will of God. I don't believe it's the mind and will of God that anyone who is a bishop have a mustache but not a beard, or is clean shaven, mustache is okay or not a beard. I don't think it's a, the mind and will of God that that is a law of God, or that is his counsel. It may be inspired, it may be combating a problem that I'm not aware of, um, but differentiation, differentiation between the laws of God, the policies of the church, and then underneath that, another category that we need to add into um, our toolkit of interpreting words that are coming at us from our leaders is wise counsel or the opinions of leaders. And the story that has been come, become self-evident in the word of wisdom discussion, especially with a historical analysis, is this opinion that keeps percolating to the surface that becomes the policy of the church, that keeps percolating, that becomes the law of God. That's what, uh, that's pharisaical. We need to be very aware of that.